Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Fertility Tips for the OBGYN, an evidence-based approach. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few quick items about today's event. First, all physicians in attendance today will receive an AMA PRA Category 1 credit, and all other providers, providers will receive a certificate of completion for one contact hour credit. The certificate will be emailed to you by Harvard around mid-summer. I would also like to note that due to a clinical matter, Dr. Ann Korkadakis will be sitting in for Dr. Erica Bove this afternoon. Dr. Korkadakis is a reproductive third-year fellow at Boston IVF and a member of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. She graduated with honors from McGill University, went on to complete a medical degree at McGill University, followed by a five-year residency in obstetrics and gynecology at Queens University. She received training in reproductive endocrinology and infertility from the University of British Columbia and holds a master's in public health from Johns Hopkins University. We encourage you to submit questions to Dr. Ann Korkadakis during using the question section of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the questions and answer session at the end of today's presentation. All right, we're ready to get started. I'm gonna pass it over to Dr. Korkadakis. Great, I'm so excited to be here today. Um, and thanks for the intro introduction, Elisa. Um, as was mentioned, these are Dr. Bobe's slides, so I, I hope to do them justice today. Um, and please send in any questions. I'm happy to chat afterwards. There we go. Um, so the plan for today is to start off by discussing how you can best prepare your patient to see an REI. Then continue on with options to start treatment at your office, um, particularly when to use Clomid versus Letrozole as a first line agent. And then how to increase success rates with current evidence-based practices. So first, how to prepare your patient to see us. So the first point is optimizing natural fertility. And I think that a lot of our patients are very kind of hyper-focused on their menstrual cycle um, and have learned a lot about this. But for couples just starting to try to conceive, um, generally, um, you don't necessarily need to be very particular about uh, identifying the ovulatory exact time frame and timing intercourse to that. In general, when patients just start off trying to conceive, we recommend having intercourse roughly two to three times per week. And that should really cover um, the fertile window. And sometimes it takes some st added stress off when they're not trying to time things completely um, closely to the ovulatory window. That being said, oftentimes as the process continues on, as, as it's becoming increasingly difficult to conceive, um, at times, they do try to target the um, intercourse to a more focused period of time. And that's when we start discussing the menstrual cycle and how that can be used to really optimize um, their fertile window. So what we tend to say is every month there's a group of follicles that start developing. They produce estrogen in increasing amounts, as you can see here. Generally, one takes the lead, and this um, estrogen leads to a positive feedback at the level of the hypothalamus and pituitary, creating an LH surge, which leads to ovulation. Now, that's the first phase of the menstrual cycle, the follicular phase. The second phase is the luteal phase, where the cyst, the corpus luteum, um, which is formed from the residual cyst that was ovulated, starts producing progesterone. And that primes the lining and gets it ready for implantation during the luteal phase. It's important to remember that the follicular phase can be a bit variable, particularly as a woman ages, the follicular phase starts to shorten because of higher levels of FSH and LH. The luteal phase tends to stay quite fixed. So what we recommend is counting back based on a 14-day luteal phase. So if someone, a patient has a 28-day menstrual cycle, we would anticipate ovulation around day 14. Whereas if they have a 30-day cycle, we would subtract 14 and expect ovulation around day 16. And that's how you would uh, counsel a patient to better identify their ovulatory period. 
So the fertile window. It's important to remember that sperm survive for longer than the egg. Once ovulated, the oocyte likely survives for up to 24 hours, whereas there's documentation of sperm um, living in the female genital tract for up to seven days. So truly, you want the sperm to be there prior or at the time of ovulation, essentially waiting for the egg. If you look here, which identifies the probability of pregnancy based on day relative to ovulation, zero being ovulation, you can see that most couples tend to get pregnant prior to ovulation. So on, this, on zero to four days prior to ovulation. So again, emphasizing that it's important to time things to prior ovulation or the day of ovulation is incredibly important. So in general, we counsel that if patients aren't monitoring ovulation in any real way, then they should have intercourse roughly every second day during the fertile period. So if they have a 28-day cycle, and we anticipate that they're ovulating around day 14, then that's really day 9 to 14, again, highlighting the fact that the most fertile period is prior to ovulation. If they are monitoring ovulation, most patients tend to do that with ovulation predictor kits. Then you tell them that the day of the positive OPK and the following day are the most high yield in terms of pregnancy. Other important things to consider uh, when a patient's interested in conceiving is really optimizing their health, um, and that includes targeting lifestyle factors. Smoking is really, really important here um, because a greater proportion of, of the population that smokes are infertile compared to the general population. Furthermore, they're at higher risk of miscarriage and there's a, a dose response to this. So you can counsel patients that reducing their um, smoking use actually even by a couple cigarettes a day is often helpful, but ideally you want them to obviously refrain completely prior to conceiving. The other important thing is that oftentimes women approach us and ask us, what can I do to optimize my egg quality? What can I do to optimize my egg counts? And that's generally reflective of age. There's not much in our control that we can do to optimize that. The exception really is smoking. It's been shown that smokers actually go through menopause one to four years earlier than non-smokers. So the average age of menopause is about 50 to 51 years old. And for heavy lifelong smokers, they tend to go through menopause in their mid to late 40s, which is a clear sign that it's impacting a quality and number. In terms of weight, um, it's been shown that ovarian and endometrial effects start at a BMI of 25, and there are reports of um, ART conceptions being decreased when looking at overweight and obese populations. It tends to also have a dose response, so it tends to be more, more marked in the obese versus overweight population, but counseling patients on trying to get their BMI down during this period is important. Of course, we're always taking other factors into consideration because the, the most imp impactful factor on um, conception really is uh, female reproductive age. So we were very mindful that even if someone is overweight, um, if they're if their later years of their reproductive life, it might be more important to start considering treatment um, kind of at the same time or in parallel of lifestyle interventions. In terms of caffeine, there's been studies showing that over 200 to 250 milligrams of caffeine per day may increase the risk of miscarriage. And that's something that I bring up routinely in all my patients, but particularly those in the recurrent pregnancy loss category. It seems like moderate consumption, meaning two cups of coffee or tea or less per day, doesn't have any effect on fertility or pregnancy loss. So you can reassure patients that they consume one to two. Um, they wouldn't, we would not necessarily recommend altering that. And I would like to kind of emphasize that the most important thing to do is to prepare your patient. And that that's true for those that are looking to conceive in the immediate future, and then those that are also kind of planning years ahead. It's, it's impressive to see, um, you know, what patients' knowledge is. There's quite kind of a, a vast array in terms of 
um, awareness about the effects of female reproductive age uh, on fertility. The graph here in the bottom left is looking at the percentage of embryos which are aneuploid, um, have an unequal amount of chromosomes based on the maternal age here at the x-axis. And it's very clear that aneuploidy increases with maternal age, even in the late 20s, early 30s, it's not zero, it's approximately 25% of embryos are aneuploid. But once you start hitting around 40, that becomes 60%. And if you look at 43 to 44, that's 90%. So 90% of a 44-year-old embryos that we biopsy for PGTA, which will be discussed a little later on, are aneuploid at that age. And that's if a patient's even able to get to the point of having embryos were able to biopsy. So I use this not to kind of scare patients or dissuade them from treatment, but just to emphasize the importance of considering fertility early on and making plans for the future with concrete uh, evidence-based knowledge. In terms of ART, I think a lot of our patients come expecting IVF to be kind of the, the answer to all their problems, but truly um, we don't have a way to circumvent um, ovarian aging. If you look at autologous IVF cycles, this is national level data, SART data, you can see that the live birth for transfer at 41 to 42 is 10%, and at 43 or older, it's less than 5%. That's compared to a 40% live birth rate per transfer at the patients under 35 years old. Obviously, we at this point uh, in the later years, we discussed other strategies like donor egg, donor embryo adoption, and they can be an incredibly important way of help, helping patients build their families. But I think a lot of our patients are surprised and disappointed when we talk to them about success rates. Um, and I think it's important knowledge to know before you know, signing up and proceeding with treatment. The other thing I wanted to add is that many fertility clinics do have age limits when it comes to treatment. So at Boston IVF, we tend not to use, um, do uh, autologous IVF cycles past the age of 44 years old. And in fact, most insurance companies will stop funding IVF cycles after 42 years old, which is really reflective of the low chance of success using autologous age at those age cutoffs. Um, so that's something to kind of consider when you're discussing with your patients, you know, an, a patient at 44 years old, what their options are, um, but really it's starting to become more limited at that age range. In terms of uh, breaking the stigma, I think that's very, very important. Um, the, it is very common um, diagnosis to have in, in fertility. 10 to 15% of the population are given that diagnosis. In terms of putting into context, this uh, figure looks at the percentage of pregnancy per month in heterosexual couples just trying to start conceiving based on age of the woman. And then the chance of miscarriage is the dotted line here. And you can see that even in your 20s, it's not a 100% chance of conceiving per month. It's close to about 20 to 25%. But that does decline over time. And in your late 30s, it's close to 10 to 15%. And then in your early to mid 40s, it's less than 5%. And that's primarily reflective of egg quality and egg number. And that's the same reason that the rate of miscarriage goes up, because there's an increase in amount of abnormal eggs leading to embryonic aneuploidy. So you do the math and there's approximately a 20% chance of pregnancy per month for couples just starting off. That means approximately 85% conceive by one year. And then after that, we tend to say that their chance of conceiving per month is less than 5% per month, oftentimes because there's an unidentified factor contributing to their infertility. Of those that continue to be managed expectantly, 90% will get pregnant within two years. In terms of when to refer, it's dependent on their age, but also dependent on their gynecologic history. So if they've had six months of unprotected sperm exposure at 35 or older, that's an indication for referral. And I think that oftentimes, you know, trying to conceive gets kind of a, it gets lost in translation a bit. 
for cu couples that are having regular unprotected intercourse, whether or not it's targeted to their ovulatory window, whether or not um, they're considering using the pull-out method, really if they're having regular unprotected intercourse over a six-month period at 35 years old, they really should start questioning whether or not they're missing something. And that definitely is an indication for a referral. Similarly, if they're under 35 years old, we give them a little bit more time just because um, their, their chance of success is not impacted um, at quite the same, uh, same rate and same time frame. So under 35, 12 months of unprotected sperm exposure. Other things to consider, they have significant risk factors for tubal disease. I've had patients with um, quite bad pelvic inflammatory disease that required admissions or required surgical management, um, patients with very extensive endometriosis, they're all at risk for tubal disease, and therefore it's not unreasonable to perform an er earlier evaluation. Certainly, if they have completely blocked fallopian tubes or bilateral hydrocelpinges, they're you know, just wasting time, um, to, put, to put it that way, um, trying to conceive on their own. The other big factor is irregular menses. Um, this, oftentimes, patients come and they've been trying for several years, and then on history, they say that they have menses every three to four months, uh, perhaps some hirsutism, some features of PCOS, or other um, types of disorders like hyperprolactinemia. If the patient's not having predictable regular menses, meaning roughly 28 days, plus or minus seven days, then they're not ovulating at regular intervals, and that really reduces their chance of conception. So it's completely reasonable to start evaluation or refer a patient um, with irregular menses almost right at the beginning. Oftentimes, um, if they have a clear picture of PCOS, we can engage in um, management even before a very extensive um, evaluation, and we'll, we'll discuss that a little later on. In terms of preparing patients, these are all testings, uh, tests that we tend to order, but it's always helpful if this is done in advance just so that we can have a better understanding of what's going on even before meeting the patient, and we can better provide um, appropriate counseling and management. In terms of ovarian reserve, we tend to rely a lot on AMH because it's not menstrual cycle dependent. And while sometimes the levels can be slightly suppressed on long-term oral contraceptive use, they tend not to be clinically different. So we tend to put a lot of emphasis and rely a lot on anti-malarian hormone. If we're doing day three labs, then we do them, we call them day three, but they tend to be done between day two and day four. And it consists of FSH, LH, and estradiol. And estradiol, as we all know, is important because we need the estradiol to be less than 100. If it's above that level, then it's difficult to interpret gonadotropins because an elevated estradiol, which we often see in women of advanced reproductive age that tend to recruit early, can falsely suppress gonadotropins and make them very difficult to interpret. That's why ordering all three is incredibly helpful. And finally, antral follicle count on ultrasound. Not all ultrasound facilities provide this. It is something that requires training in terms of being able to correctly identify the follicles that are two to nine millimeters and provide an estimate on either side. But it's also oftentimes helpful when used in combination with the other ovarian reserve tests. In terms of a semen analysis, um, it's important to consider what lab you're using because not all labs use the 2021 WHO criteria. They, very, they use very strict morphology uh, criteria where a, the cutoff for normal morphology is 4%. And that they use, as I said, a very strict uh, set of parameters to be able to identify abnormal morphology. And, and that's why we put a lot of emphasis on having a high quality semen analysis. For tubes and cavity assessment, we often rely on hysterosalpingogram because it allows us to view fallopian tube pathology as well as the uterine cavity all in one examination. If we're worried about any finding on HSG, um, any suggestion of a filling defect, um, then or, or sometimes an adhesion, then we often turn to a saline-infused uh, sauna histogram that allows us to see a little bit more um, detail in the uterine cavity.
Then intraoperatively, if one of if the patient is considering or is undergoing uh, fertility treatment and or and or evaluation, and they're having a surgery, um, a diagnostic laparoscopy, it's definitely in, worth considering performing chromal perturbation at the same time to be able to clearly visualize tubal patency um, intraoperatively. Other preconception testing that we can that we order tends to be an ID screen just to make sure their general health is optimized prior to treatment, um, making sure that they're immune to rubella and varicella, and if they're not, then update their vaccines, and uh, a TSH because we know that it can be quite impactful on um, menstrual cycles as well as fertility. In terms of genetic screening, ACOG recommends a minimal of assessing whether or not they're carriers for cystic fibrosis and spinal muscular atrophy, just because of the frequency of these conditions in the population. We often offer expanded carrier screening, and it isn't uncommon to have patients that are carriers for the same condition. And this is particularly important, they're considering fertility treatment to begin with, because we do have methods of testing embryos for a particular gene mutation, uh, which would allow us to select for embryos that are free of these conditions. Um, and uh, that's kind of important information and knowledge to have. If the patient has any sign of hirsutism, we, we order 17 OHP in the follicular phase, and that's to rule out congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And then we find the total testosterone to be most um, important in terms of ruling out any um, testosterone producing tumor in either the ovary or adrenals. If we suspect PCOS, then we often screen for insulin resistance um, with a, a two hour GTT. And then they have irregular cycles. That's when we add on prolactin. In a patient with infertility and regular menstrual cycles with a, a otherwise negative review of systems, um, there doesn't tend to be a ton of benefit to prolactin. The way prolactin affects fertility is truly through disrupt disrupting normal menstrual cycles. So we tend to reserve uh, prolactin testing for those with irregular cycles. As we all know, prolactin can be falsely elevated for many reasons. Stress, if the patient's not fasting, if it's not obtained first thing in the morning, and also if they have a high level of macroprolactin. So I think that when we order prolactin on everyone, we tend to chase ourselves, um, reorder it, order macroprolactin, and oftentimes um, it just comes back normal, particularly in patients, as I, I mentioned, with regular cycles. Options to start treatment at the office. So first it comes to diagnosing PCOS, and we tend to use the Rotterdam criteria for that, which requires at least two of the three features for diagnosis. So disordered ovulation, cycles, a cycle interval greater than 35 days or having less than 10 menses a year. Clinical or biochemical hyperandrogenism, so either signs of excess facial hair or significant acne um, or biochemical in terms of elevated testosterone levels. And in a patient you're not sure if she quite meets that diagnosis because she doesn't have much clinical hyperandrogenism, I find that that's when the biochemical uh, testing is important because it can kind of solidify that diagnosis. For polycystic ovaries, the criteria has changed. It used to be over 12 follicles, nine to a two to nine millimeters, but there's some thought that we might be overdiagnosing patients with just a robust ovarian reserve. So recently, one of the European societies has suggested that we increase it to 20 or more follicles um, on one side, or an ovarian volume of over 10 milliliters. It's important to keep in mind that oftentimes in young patients and in, in teenagers or women in their young 20s, they often have a robust ovarian reserve. So um, if they have a high follicle number, but regular menstrual cycles, they wouldn't quite meet this definition. It's important to keep in mind as well that we need to exclude other conditions. So things like Cushing's congenital adrenal hyperplasia or tumors, really PCOS is a diagnosis of exclusion. So you need to be sure that you're they have no clinical features of Cushing's. Um, the 17 OHP was ordered. The total testosterone is an exceedingly high. And I would also add TSH, TSH to that because that can also confound the picture, particularly when it comes to cycle irregularity.
PCOS is probably one of the most common uh, for infertility conditions. It's in 10% of reproductive aged women. Of those with irregular cycles, it's very frequent, up to 90%. Most PCOS patients aren't amenorrheic. Most of them do have cycles, although, although they are irregular. So it's less frequent in those with complete amenorrhea. And this is on ultrasound, the classic string of pearls um, that we see in terms of the follicles all located at the periphery of the ovary. So starting treatment, if you have a patient and she meets the, the criteria for PCOS, what do you do? Well, these patients are great to work with because if you can restore their normal auditory cycles, their fertility is really comparable to that of the general population. Um, so it tends to be quite satisfying. There is a really well-designed RCT in 2004 by Lagros team that showed that letrozole is really the agent to use versus Clomid or clomiphene citrate. Using letrozole res resulted in higher birth rate, so 27.5 versus 19.1%. Um, and there is a trend towards a decrease in multifetal gestation, so less twins and triplets. In terms of monitoring, if the patient's not at an ART center, not getting regular ultrasounds and um, serum screening, then it's sufficient to do a progesterone level seven to nine days after their, their LH surge detected on an ovulation predictor kit. And if the progesterone is over three, then that suggests they ovulated. And within the next week or so, you would expect them to either have a have a period if it wasn't successful or um, have a positive pregnancy test. It's important to keep in mind that sometimes the PCOS population has a difficult time to, uh, detecting a positive surge on the ovulation kit just because they have high baseline levels of LH. So we tend to tell them not to start testing at least until day eight of their menstrual cycle because early on, if you start testing very early, we'd expect high levels and that could lead to false positives and confusion. So if you're able to restore this, these menstrual cycles, um, then it would be reasonable to continue for three to four cycles. If after four cycles they're not pregnant, um, then we would start considering you know, further treatment and that would require a referral. Um, some patients look letrozole up and they're surprised to see that it's not FDA approved for this indication. Um, however, it's very well studied and overall uh, very safe in terms of side effect profiles. Some patients have headaches, um, some have some mild vasomotor symptoms, minor sleep disturbances, but overall it's very well tolerated. So what about clomiphene? Um, as reproductive endocrinologists, we tend to reserve it for unexplained infertility or if they're not really responding to letrozole. There's some evidence that if you use Clomid in combination with intrauterine insemination, it could increase pregnancy rates compared to couples trying on their own. So it brings it from less than 5% if they're trying um, to conceive spontaneously after one year of being, uh, being unsuccessful to about 10 to 15% per cycle with Clomid and both IUI. If, so, if a patient's having regular menstrual cycles, Clomid alone doesn't seem to help in, um, increase pregnancy rates because what Clomid does is establishes normal menses and ovulation. Um, therefore, in patients with regular cycles, there's not much of a benefit, and that's why we tend to use it in combination with IUI. How to increase success rates with current evidence-based practice. So first, um, identifying the correct condition, PCOS, where we would use letrozole with relations and or with IUI. Unexplained infertility, where we'd be thinking of a, a medicated IUI, medicated meaning often clomiphene or letrozole. And then if they have tubal factor or severe male factor, then we tend to go direct to IVF because the success rates are extremely low with either expectant um, or medicated IUI management. And if it's not straightforward, oftentimes um, we're thinking about adding adjuncts and different types of uh, specialized evaluations, uh, which we'll address shortly. So pre-implantation genetic screening for aneuploidy. This has been a 
involving technology. Previously, we used to do biopsies on embryos at the day three stage, where we would take an entire blastomere, which was roughly about one-sixth of the embryo, and send it for genetic analysis. This was probably done a decade or so ago. And studies sh sh had shown at that time that when you're taking such a large component of the embryo, it does actually impact implantation rates. This has evolved though. Now we tend to do blastocyst biopsies. Blastocysts are day five, day six, or day seven embryos that are organized like this. They have a trophectoderm, which are the cells in the periphery that are flattened, and then they have a collection of inner cell mass. The trophectoderm is what will become the placenta, whereas the inner cell mass is what will become the embryo. So for these trophectoderm or day five biopsies or day six or day seven, what we tend to do is we tend to take five cells uh, approximately of what will become the placenta. So five trophectoderm cells and send them for analysis. That's five cells in an embryo, which is, a prop, which is several thousand cells at this stage. So studies have shown that if you're doing a trophectoderm biopsy, it does not tend to impact implantation rate. So truly it's safer for embryos. The caveat is that it's not, it's a screening modality, it's not diagnostic. So there's roughly a 5% false positive or false negative rate, which means that roughly in one in 20 embryos, you'll be discarding an embryo that's labeled as abnormal, but is truly normal. The other caveat is we have to get patients to the stage where they have blastocysts to be able to do this biopsy. And oftentimes in older patients and those with diminished ovarian reserve, we can't necessarily push them to day five or they won't get to a transfer. So there, have, there is an evolving literature that shows that this technology seems to be very beneficial in older women with a robust reserve. So if we expect a high number of embryos in the patients over 38, then that's definitely more of an indication to consider PGTA because we would expect a significant proportion of those embryos to be abnormal and it could help us select the normal one first. If someone's older with less of an ovarian reserve, more of a diminished ovarian reserve picture, then it's definitely less clear. And that's kind of a time where we tend to have a more open discussion with patient in terms of their tolerance of potentially a miscarriage or potentially carrying a pregnancy um, that was abnormal that would be picked up on first trimester screening. In the younger patient populations, becoming a more and more common request. And again, it's something that we discuss with patients, the pros and cons and the limitations of the testing. But truly the literature based on RCT data as well as retrospective data has highlighted that this technology best serves the older patient population. The benefit that has been clearly shown is that because we're identifying eupoid embryos with this technology and because they're associated with a higher implantation rate, we're less likely to do a double or triple embryo transfer. We're more pushed to do an elective single embryo transfer. So with this technology, we do see our multiple rate declining, which is obviously very important. In terms of endometrial receptivity assay, the window of, uh, of implantation is physiologic and it's based on the start of progesterone. In patients with recurrent implantation failure, there is some data that perhaps their window of implantation is either shorter or pushed further back or forward. So this testing, which is essentially is an endometrial biopsy looking at markers during this window of implantation, can guide in terms of the transfer period. Should we be transferring a day or two later? Should we be transferring a day or two earlier based on the progesterone start time? It's been clearly shown that this is not a technology that should be used as first line. There is no benefit to use this in you know, the entire patient population. Um, but in patients with recurrent implantation failure, it is a tool that we have and discuss and has been shown to be um, helpful in individual patients. In terms of recurrent pregnancy loss, it is definitely a frustrating diagnosis because despite an extensive workup, um, up to 75% of cases have no clear etiology. And there's a really good ASRM guideline in terms of managing evaluation and treatment. And I tend to categorize it in making sure there's no endocrine dysfunction, like a thyroid disorder, hyperglycemic state, um, an issue with 
prolactin. I then think of genetic, make sure that their karyotypes are normal, they don't carry a balanced translocation for both, the, this would be both partners. Then thinking of autoimmune, and there's some evidence that antiphospholipid antibody syndrome is associated with RPL. And then finally, anatomic, making sure we're not missing uh, intracavitary thyroid polyp or adhesion. In terms of next steps, obviously, if the thyroid or hyperglycemic um, disturbance is identified, you correct it. For those with a balanced translocation, we can do PGT-SR, which, which identifies the translocations and would identify normal balanced embryos. If they have antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, there's great data showing that the combination of unfractionated heparin and low-dose aspirin is very helpful. And then you can discuss the option of luteal progesterone if there's three consecutive miscarriages. Um, we used to rely a lot on endometrial biopsies with pathologic diagnosis in terms of displaced windows, but it's been shown that it's not incredibly helpful, that a lot of the population that's fertile seems to have a displaced window when you're looking just at pathologic criteria. So we tend to just offer progesterone just in case there's a luteal phase deficiency. But I believe that most of us think that that's very uncommon um, in um, the general population. In terms of adjuncts, I think these are things that we start considering when first line treatment isn't working. Um, they often tend to target uh, the immune system, either overactive or underactive immune system. There's very little data on these adjuncts, particularly very little randomized control data. Um, the issue is that there's no consistencies in the dosing or in the outcomes that are studied, so it's really hard to kind of group the data together. Um, I would say that most of us really reserve this as like third or fourth line as something to try to add on to motivate a patient to continue with treatment. Um, but again, it, the efficacy isn't very clearly established. So as a conclusion, um, preparing your patient to see an RE involves discussing natural fertility, decreasing the stigma, normalizing um, infertility, and then potentially starting the evalu evaluation if you feel comfortable. Starting treatment could be straightforward, and it starts with the correct diagnosis. Do they have PCOS? Do they have unexplained? Are you thinking severe male factor or tubal factor? Immunologic adjuncts are generally not helpful, and they do have the possibility for harm. So again, we don't tend to use them first line. Evidence-based practices are really important to discuss, and they include optimizing modifiable factors such as weight, smoking, potentially using PGTA in certain cases, and evaluating the endometrium for optimizing timing, again, particularly in the setting of multiple unsuccessful transfers. Yeah, so I, I really, truly hope that was helpful, and I'm looking forward to hearing some questions. Um, this is Dr. Beauvais' email, but certainly I can share mine as well if um, there are any questions or concerns that should be addressed in the email form. Um, and I think that um, Dr. Beauvais wanted to give a special thanks to her colleagues uh, at Boston IVF, um, her mentors, and then I think her, her team, which is really an integral part to the whole patient experience and care. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Korkadakis. We're now gonna begin answering questions submitted during today's presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit your questions through the questions pane in the attendee control panel. The first question is, how are we currently using AMH? That's a really great question. Um, and we it's not uncommon to have patients that aren't experiencing infertility, but asking to, for us to test their AMH in order to be able to kind of plan and time things appropriately. But I always counsel patients that AMH is not predictive of spontaneous conception. I, we have patients with very low AMHs, but have you know our spontaneous ovulation and are cycling regularly, and you know they conceive on their own within a few months. So it's not really helpful in terms of predicting spontaneous conception. Also, you have to keep in mind that it's one point in time. So we don't know if an AMH is on the lower side. Was it always on the lower side or has there been a change? So we don't really have a concept in terms of decline or rate of decline. 
where it's helpful, it's helpful to uh, for us as REs to be able to guide our dosing. So someone with a more diminished AMH might need higher gonadotropin dosing for ovarian stimulation. And it, there's also evolving data that it might give us a little bit of an understanding of reproductive window. Will a patient go through menopause at the anticipated time, 50 to 51? Is it earlier than anticipated? So I think that information is useful, but it's important to clearly outline the fact that it's not predictive of spontaneous conception. And in fact, it's very conflicting as to whether or not it's predictive of conception ART as well. Um, again, because we're, we're not taking a quality into consideration with AMH. So we, we tend to use it in terms of guiding treatment and guiding dosing, um, but I am very clear with patients that it does not provide information in terms of egg quality or chance of spontaneous conception. Thank you. The next question is, what are the rates of tubal disease with chlamydia that does not lead to PID? Um, that's a really great question, and I, I don't know if I have the answer to it. What I would say is that when we are performing HSGs, a lot of times, I'd say at least 50% of patients with bilateral tubal blockage do not have a known history of an SCI. So I think that there is a lot of pathology that's happening in a silent manner. Um, so it, obviously, they have clear risk factors for tubal disease. It might be important to, to investigate early on, um, but really, there's not really a patient population that we say, you know, let's defer tubal assessment. It's really important as um, an infertility evaluation for all patients. As I mentioned, oftentimes, um, the uh, chlamydia or gonorrhea can be silent in terms of acting on the tubes. Thank you. The next question is, many resources cite that progesterone over five indicates ovulation. Why level three and not five? I think that was in your presentation. Yeah, I think it's very lab-based. So if your lab just um, has a cutoff of five, I think that's appropriate. I would say in, in most textbooks, they do use over three um, nanograms per mil as a cutoff. Um, it's important to also emphasize that it's really just a cutoff. So you're just looking for a number above that. Um, sometimes patients say, you know, my progesterone was 5.2, but I know my friends was like 20. Does that mean that they have better luteal support? And the answer is no, it's, it's an all or nothing. Progesterone levels fluctuate throughout the day. So having repeat values or having an absolute level isn't truly important doesn't really inform us on the quality of the luteal support. It just tells us whether or not they ovulated. So if your lab uses five, I think that's fine to have as established cutoff. Um, but again, it's just a cutoff um, after you know three or five, the absolute level isn't as important. Great, we have a lot of questions. Um, the next <laughs> one is, can you use Clomid after letrozole in a woman with PCOS who ovulates? For example, three cycles of each before referring to an REI. That's a great question, and I don't think that's been studied. Uh, if someone is not responding to letrozole, so you start at 2.5, they're not ovulating, start at five, and then go up to five, and then step up to 7.5, and they're still not ovulating, then definitely you can consider Clomid. There are patients that respond to Clomid but don't respond to letrozole. But if you're, they're ovulating regularly on letrozole, they're getting the positive P4, they're getting um, their period signifying that they are responding. I don't think there's data suggesting that there's a benefit to trying letrozole and then Clomid. So is there, as long as they're responding, I would stick to three to four cycles of letrozole. And if they're not pregnant by then, considering moving on. This is a similar question. It talked about after four cycles of letrozole in the office, can you switch to Clomid? Um, I think it was in relationship to having a lot of patients with without insurance. So maybe a suggestion of what to do. Yeah, I mean, I think if um, IUI is not an option, I think it's, it's worth at least discussing the option of adding on IUI, even if they're self-paid, it's definitely a bit more affordable than IVF, but it does you know, improve um, pregnancy rates. Um, there's some small data that letrozole may cause more endometrial thinning of the lining than Clomid. So I think that if, you know, a patient is, is, is truly not um, able to consider IUI or IVF, um, 
three cycles of letrozole, and then if they're responding considering three cycles of Clomid, maybe there's an improvement in endometrial development. Again, I wouldn't say that's data-based, um, but that would just be kind of targeted to that particular patient who's unable to move forward. Thank you. The next question is, what do you think about the home fertility tests? Um, I, I think that they're very wide in range, and I've had patients um, do home fertility tests while they're on the OCP, so I think that there's a lot of confusion in terms of how they can be appropriately used, and um, I think it's difficult to interpret. As I said, you know, patients with PCOS have high baseline LHs, so oftentimes it really confounds their ovulatory window or their peak fertility. So I would just try, I, I encourage patients to stick with ovulation predictor kits. You know, are they detecting an LH surge? If they conduct, detect an LH surge, that's great. Then I really don't see added value in understanding more about the hormone profiles. And if they're not able to detect their LH surge, then um, I, I think that considering monitoring, considering ultrasound and blood work, it's probably a, a lot more helpful than these home fertility kits. Um, which haven't been well studied um, in terms of their uh, accuracy. All right, the next question is, um, one big issue that comes up is insurance coverage. Any advice for patients um, less than 35 with mass health that have failed office management? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I, what I would say is, um, <laughs> As a fellow at Boston IVF, we see patients for an initial consult free of charge. Um, so we often come across patients with, that are unassured or with mass health. And so the initial consult is free of charge. And oftentimes we can at least give them information in terms of making sure the workup's complete, talk to them about success rates with IUR or IVF, is it even worth considering, discussing costs associated with it. And then there is the option to buy insurance for short periods of time through the Mass Health Finder. And we provide patients that information on how they're able to kind of purchase insurance or have different, you know, consider different potentially employers, which obviously more difficult than it sounds, but employers that have private fully insured insurance, which mandates coverage. So I would say having a good idea of success rates for IUI or IVF and cost just to give that, them that information and for them to make an informed decision moving forward. And then you know, giving them some information on how they could potentially obtain coverage. Um, we're always ha happy to facilitate an initial consult. I'm always happy to, to see patients and give them that information as well. Thank you. The next question is, do you always do a baseline ultrasound before ovulation induction using letters all to rule out a large cyst? Do you repeat it with each cycle? It's a great question. Um, there's data showing that if patients are responding to the Clomid or Letrozole, there's not a great benefit to added monitoring. So if they're not being monitored, then I don't always do baseline ultrasounds. I tell them to start um, day three to day seven in their cycle or day five to day nine, depending on what, you're, what they're electing for do the ovulation predictor kits, and then definitely with their first cycle detect P4. If they're starting to have some pain or for some reason, you know, they were responding to the letrozole and then they're not anymore, then that's an indication to kind of bring them in and make sure we're not missing a big cyst or any pathology. Um, but if your patient's responding to them, having no concerns or complaints, then I think it's completely fine for them to do home monitoring with OPKs um, and continue for three to four cycles. Okay, the next question is, if there's a workup is diagnostic for PCOS, do you always recommend completing a HSG and semen analysis to rule, rule out other etiology before starting letrozole? That's a great question. Um, you know, I think it's, it's all dependent on um, if, really if you're working in a mandated state or not. So um, patients that do have insurance coverage, if, you know, you detect bilateral tubal blockage on HSG, then that will potentially cover their treatment um, even without having a six to 12 month period of infertility. So the patient has insurance, um, then I tend to do a tubal evaluation and semen analysis earlier, just to make sure we're not missing anything that would kind of save them costs down the line. 
If they don't, then I think that if they're in the absence of risk factors, meaning you know no history of SDIs or PID or pelvic surgery, um, no you know male inguinal hernia repair or um, persistent toxic agent exposures. I think in the absence of risk factors, um, it's definitely reasonable to discuss pa with patient deferring these evaluations. I mean, if they're not having regular cycles because they're PCOS, then you're really just kind of establishing a normal kind of ovul ovulatory cycle with uh, ovulation induction methods. So it's definitely reasonable to defer. And then if they're not responding after three to four months or three to more- Something four, went wrong. Sorry Please about try that. Again three to four cycles, then considering um, a semen analysis and HSG at that time. Okay, just to due to time, this is gonna be our last question. There's a few more in the waiting room. I will have them answered and then we can email them to you. Um, but is there, is there any modification of your approach to a patient who is old, older than 40 years old? Sorry, let me re reread that. Is there any modification of your approach to a patient who is 40 years older and above? Um, I, I would say get them seen sooner. So we say, you know, six months of trying to conceive uh, over 35, but once they're over 40, it's not unreasonable to refer them after, you know, a couple of months, just because we don't really want to be wasting time. If there is a severe, severe, severe male factor, if there is a tubal factor, and they're not going to conceive spontaneously, it's important to pick that up sooner rather than later, because after 40, waiting six months really does affect success rates in terms of both spontaneous conception and ART. So having that discussion, sending them for referral sooner rather than later is important. In terms of our management, it's, it's a bit dependent. Um, oftentimes we'll discuss the higher success rates with IVF, um, particularly over 40. Um, and then we'll bring up the option of kind of donor egg and donor embryo sooner, just so they can have it as like a reference. Because if the success of IVF using your own eggs at 41 is about 20%, um, using a donor egg is close to 60% for transfer. So I think that having that discussion early, normalizing it, and having them be able to use that as a reference is incredibly um, in informative, or I hope so. Thank you. There are a few more questions. We will have them answered and we will email them to you at the end of the presentation, um, hopefully by tomorrow morning. Um, but thank you so much, Dr. Korkodakis, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar, Fertility Tips for the OBGYN, an evidence-based approach. If you have any other questions, please you can contact myself, Alyssa Cooper, ecooper at bostonivf.com, and I will have Dr. Korkodakis or Dr. Bove email, uh, answer them for you. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate it if you could complete the survey and provide your feedback to help us with future educational webinars. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of Boston IVF and Dr. Korkadakis, thank you so much for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you again. Have a great day. Thanks for joining in.